You guys go ahead and stand with us. you glad that we have a God who fights on our behalf for us? Let's give God thanks for that. Yeah. We're excited to see you here today. We're going to continue our series, uh, Honest to God, part three of that today. Eager to share that message with you. Uh, also, as you came in, hopefully you got a program. And in that, there's a connect card. If you'll fill that out for us, prayer requests, 
Uh, there's also uh, announcements in your bulletin, and one of those uh, that I want to make mention of is Connect a Crossroads. It's really an entry point to getting involved at our church here beyond the Sunday morning worship gathering. So uh, check that box if you'd like to come next Sunday after this service uh, for Connect a Crossroads. We're going to do some more great worship, and then uh, at the end of the service, you'll be able to drop that Connect card and offering in the baskets on your way out. Thanks for being here. Let's go back to some great worship. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful Your goodness is running out. It's running out. 
Thank you for this house that we get to come to worship your name. Father, thank you for uh, this congregation that we are seeking your face. Father, I pray for Pastor Rod as he comes to bring the message um, that you would give him 
an open mind to speak your word. Father, open our hearts to what you have for us this morning. Let us receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So glad to see you again here today. We are smack dab in the middle of a series called Honest to God. And I hope the last two weeks were fruitful for you as we learned and talked about spending time with God and not just to do that, but how to do that. And that you've been creating space in your life for God to meet with you. And you're seeing uh, just breakthrough and, and renewing and refreshing from the Lord as you do that on a consistent basis. Uh, now we're sort of shifting gears in the series and we're going to be addressing emotion that as we go to God in our time alone with him, that it's good and right to bring whatever emotion we're feeling to him. Because if we don't, what what will happen is our emotions will get the best of us. And, and left unchecked, those emotions will fester and, and sort of drive our behavior and drive our thinking and our attitudes. And, and just, it's not where God would have us to be. And so, um, so we got to learn to deal with them and nothing drives our, our uh, drives us harder than the emotion of fear. And I spoke on fear back in March. Uh, remember 2020 was, was like a normal year in February. Remember that? And then March hit and all the craziness started. And, and so I did a message on fear back then because I thought it was very appropriate. I felt Lord led me to that. We're going to hit it again today because listen, fear is one of those things that is a root cause like the root of a tree, it might seem hidden, but it produces all kinds of fruit in our life. Uh, things like worry and anxiety and insecurity and a bunch of other things come out of the root of fear. And so we're going to talk about this, this idea of emotion of fear and how it can drive us away from where God wants us. And it can dictate our lives, but it doesn't have to. In fact, when we feel fear, when we feel these emotions, the best thing to do instead of be driven by our emotion is to bring that honestly to God. God, I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling this fear and, and do business with God and allow God in that space to manage that emotion, reorient us to the thinking, the truth of God that, that he has for us about that issue. And then our attitudes and our actions are not driven by our emotion, but by the truth of God. And so that's what we're going to do today, even though we may feel fear. And listen, we've had plenty of reasons to fear that we would not be driven by them um, in our fear. So uh, turn your Bible, if you got it, to Psalm 46. And I hope whether you bookmark it on your software, Bible software, or in your Bible that you've got with you, that when fear creeps back in, because I was talking about this after the first service, you get fear conquered for a moment and then it creeps back in. And so when fear creeps back in our life, I pray you'll go back to this psalm as sort of a, a bedrock for where you go when fear tries to creep in to your life. And it says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. First word right out of the gate, God is where we go when we fear. God is a refuge. God is a shelter. God is our strength. Meaning this, that he takes us through the issue and through the problem and through what we fear, though we would rather him take us around those things and avoid the problems and the issues in the life that we fear. He says, listen, I'll be the God that's your strength while you travel through the issue and the problem. He says, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. He is ever present, meaning God is always ready. He was always near. It reminds me when you hand your keys to your kid for the first time and it's their maiden voyage on their own. And you tell them, listen, Hey, whatever, if anything happens, if you need anything, just call, call me. I'll be there. I'll have my phone on. I'll be watching for you. In fact, you don't know that, but I'm stalking you on Life 360. I'm following your every move. And my daughter drove to Myrtle Beach with her friend yesterday, and it took them like nine hours. And I watched every stop they took along the way because I'm present. I'm near. And God says, listen, I am ever-present God. I'm not unaware. I am, I am near. I am ready. I'm, I'm saying I'll be there. And so over and over again in the scriptures, God says, do not fear. You should look up sometime how many times in the word God says, do not fear. 
And, and nearly every time he says, do not fear, the reason he gives is simply this, because I am with you. I am with you. He said that to Moses. He said that to Joshua. He said that to Isaiah and Jeremiah and to David over and over again. Do not fear, for I am with you. And he would say that to you and I today, regardless of what you're facing and regardless of your fear. Listen, if you know Christ, then I am the God who is near and present, and I am with you. And when fear is present, I am present also. And because I'm present, God says, you don't have to fear. Verse 2, therefore, because God is present, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. It's a resolve to say, listen, I will not fear. Why? Because of who God is is. Not only is he ever present, we're going to look through the rest of the psalm, all, all kinds of ways that, and assurances that because of who God is, you and I as his people don't have to fear. Even in the worst case scenarios, when the things you think that are solid, the earth and the mountains, the things we say are unshakable, when those things shake, we ought not fear. When, when, the, when the world around us is shaking and roaring and trembling, when evil appears to be winning, when the foundations of life and liberty are in peril, kind of like 2020, right? It's been a rough year. When the foundations are shook, when the world shakes, we don't have to shake because there is an immovable God and his presence is near. We can say, I will not fear. And I can watch what's on TV, and even though the world seems to be crumbling around us, and the news is terrifying, and all this is happening, I won't fear because the power of God that is with me is greater than the forces around me. Now, will we feel fear? Absolutely. We'll feel the emotion of fear. There's times that that happens. But this resolve says, I will not allow that fear to dictate and dominate my life. I will not let it consume my soul so that my soul attention is on what I fear. Second Corinthians 5, 7, 7 says this, for we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith not by sight. As people of faith, even though we see these things happening around us, what we understand is this, the unseen God who is unseen, he's greater than what we see. And what we know about this God is greater than the unknown we face tomorrow. We live by faith, trusting in a God who is invisible yet near. We live by faith. In the chaos, God is in control. Amen? When COVID-19 struck, God was in control. When unemployment raged, God is in control. When isolation happened, God is in control. When injustice was served, God was in control. When riotings were happening, God is in control. And so much of the unknown and the shaking of our world that is happening today, God is not moved. He is a firm foundation and rock in which we stand on. When all other foundations shake, he doesn't. He stands firm. And those who trust in him stand unmoved as well because they stand upon their God. And it says this, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Now, he's describing Jerusalem. It's, it's uh, the city of God. It's sort of the center of the universe and God's universe is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And for a lot of reasons, but it was a very coveted piece of land back in, in this day because it had two great things going for it. One, it had elevation. It is surrounded by two valleys. And so it is on a peninsula of land, and it's very easy to defend because it's a very high place to try to get to, easily defensible. And secondly... It has water. Water is the spring of Gihon. And so two things, defense and water for crops and waters to drink. You got a great city. Jerusalem had both. 
In the days of King Hezekiah, the Assyrians were coming to encamp and surround Jerusalem and to siege it and to destroy it. And so King Hezekiah said, listen, I can't let that spring serve his armies. I'm going to divert that water and I'm going to reflow it into the city of Jerusalem. And so in a hurry, he dug a tunnel through solid rock, starting on both sides because he was in a hurry. Think of Stone Mountain, literally tunneling through Stone Mountain. And, and they dug about a mile through this, and the two tunnels almost exactly met up. It was an engineering marvel. And they, the water was redirected through Hezekiah's tunnel into the city of Jerusalem where they could be watered and fed. And though the armies of Assyria besieged them, they were fine. Now, if you have enough money, you can actually pay to walk through Hezekiah's tunnel. I don't recommend it because I did it. And this is where I found out I was a little claustrophobic, <laughs> incidentally. And I was fine because there was cool water flowing through our feet. That felt good. And it got narrow in certain places. And I didn't love that, but I got by. But really what got me is when the people in front of us stopped and didn't move. I was like, I want to get out of here. I'm tired of this tunnel. I will never go through Hezekiah's tunnel again. It's still there today. But Hezekiah dug this tunnel and he turned the water into refreshing water. In verse two, there was the roaring waters of the swirls of this world. Now God is reorienting our eyes to these peaceful, tranquil, refreshing waters. Did you know in the Garden of Eden, there was a river flowing, a water. In the Old Testament is the spring of Gihon that refreshed God's people. Jesus came in John 4 and says, I am the living water. In the new uh, kingdom, uh, the millennial kingdom, the, uh, Zechariah describes a river flowing from Jerusalem. It's not there yet, but there's going to be a river flowing from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, giving life and refreshing that whole region. And even in Revelation 7, it says there's liver, living water flowing from the throne of God. See, God's presence, what these things are saying is simply this. The presence of God through his Holy Spirit is a, like a river of peace flowing from him to his people. In fact, listen to Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the one who's not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and in their law he med they meditate day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and it does not wither. What is the point? When the storms of life come, Plant yourself by the fertile, life-giving, peace-giving streams of God. Drink deeply from your God. Get near to God. Find the water hole of God where peace and joy and gladness. See, God isn't just worried about you not having fear. He said, listen, I want you to so overcome fear. I want you to be a people of gladness in the midst of the trembling of the nations. You can have my peace. And you and I can have a calm that is not of this world because we have a source of peace that is not of this world. The world doesn't have this flowing stream of peace, but we do. By the, by the very presence of God, we can drink of his peace regardless of what is going on in the world and regardless of what is going on in our lives. He's there. Heard a great illustration of that. Uh, Tony Evans is a preacher, and he told a story about uh, going to a hotel out of town. And, and while he's in his hotel room with his wife, the power goes out. I mean, everything goes black. And he's muddling through there, gets to the window, and he realizes it wasn't just their hotel. The, the blocks and blocks, as far as he could see, were just black, just pitch black in darkness. That the, the power had gone out in the city. And then his eye is drawn down the road to one hotel with a bar and a, and a restaurant and people are going in and out and the lights are blaring and the music's going and, and they're just having a grand time. He's like, what in the world? And he couldn't help himself and he had to go over and he's like, how is it that you have, have, uh, have all this going while everything else is in blackness? And I said, the manager said, listen, the rest of the city is tied to the city power grid. But we have generators 
And so we're not drawing from the same source everyone else is. We've got a source that they don't have. We have got refreshment and life because our source is a different source. Guys, we have the eternal God who is a stream of living water of peace and gladness that flows into the hearts of his people and that we can have a calm that the world doesn't know. And so since we have an ever-present God, we have his promises, we know how the world's going to end, we have all this and more, because he is present, we can have joyful hope. Joyful hope. Then it says this, God is within her. He's speaking about Jerusalem still. God is within her. She will not fall. <clears throat> God will... Help her at the break of day. So the mountains fall in verse 2. It's the same word used here. Even though the mountains fall and the world's trembling and all this stuff's falling apart and the nations are tottering, we don't. The people of God in Jerusalem, the people of God in his church today, we don't shake and we don't totter because our God is the most high God. That's what it said in the verse before. He is God most high. High. You know what that means? Is that God rules and reigns from up here. And he sees the entire picture. And he knows from eternity past to eternity future. He knows everything that's happening in the world. He knows, he knows the grand scheme of his plan and how it's playing out for his purposes. And we're stuck down here, wadding and wading through the muck and the mire. And we don't have the same perspective he does. He is God most high. And so we can trust his vantage point over our own. Do I always understand? Do you always understand why God does the things he does? No. But when God chooses to do things, he doesn't check with me. How about you? He does what he knows is right and good for his purposes because he is God most high. In fact, Paul didn't know what was happening in Acts 27. He, he knew he was going to Rome. And on his trip to Rome, the ship that he's traveling on gets blown out to sea by this, this terrible, crazy storm. And for days and days, it drives them further and further out to the sea. They've given up their cargo. They've thrown most of their food into the ocean. They've given up to die, except Paul. And Paul, when everyone else is freaking out, Paul's calm. Because he knows what they don't know. Because he is a source they don't have. And in the end of all that, before, uh, before it's over though, the angel appears to him and says, listen, I'm going to spare your life and the lives of everyone on this ship because you have not feared only God have you feared. And all the people on this ship are going to know that your God reigns supreme because of your faith, because you stayed calm in the storm. And God does exactly that. Saves every one of their lives. I also want to point your attention to the verse there when it says, when God intervenes. It says he intervenes at the break of day. You know what that means? It's dawn. You know when it's darkest in the night? It's right before dawn. Right before dawn is the darkest part of the night. And perhaps what God is saying is right in the darkest moment when things look the most bleak, that is when I'll intervene and that's when I show up and that's when I come as your help and your strength and your refuge. It ought to remind us of a couple things in scripture at, at dawn is when God's people that were, that were slaves in Egypt for generation and generation are delivered out of that and God brings them out and through wonders of his power and he brings them to the Red Sea and he has them hold up there and, and Pharaoh's hearts change and he decides he's going to send every one of his chariots and mow them down and bring them back into slavery in Egypt. And so they're stuck between the Red Sea and the armies of Pharaoh. And then at the break of day, God makes a way through the Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground and God swallows up the enemies of Egypt in the bottom of the sea. It's at dawn that God delivers them and helps them. 
It might remind us in the New Testament on the first Easter Sunday that Jesus, the morning star, it said that he rose from the dead at dawn, that he came to life, that God had conquered death and sin and hell in one fell swoop, that the death and resurrection of Jesus broke the power of all those things and offered eternal life to all who come to faith in him at dawn. And then lastly, it is meant to remind us of the faithfulness of God. Just like the star, the sun comes up every morning, the earth rotates on his axis. You weren't surprised when you woke up this morning and it was sunny outside, were you? You expected the sun to be there. Why? Because as sure as the earth turns on his axis is our God's faithfulness to you and to me. He can be counted on and trusted in the darkness of night. There is light and daybreak coming. He is faithful. He delivers his people. Then it says this. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. All kind of uproar happening, all kinds of scheming of nations against one another. Things seem out of control, and then God speaks. It reminds me of when Jesus is on the ship with his disciples crossing the, the Sea of Galilee, and he's so tired, he's sleeping, and there's a storm, and they're fearful for their life, and they wake Jesus, and they said, Jesus, help us. And he stands, and he says to the waves and the wind, calm, be still. And in that instant, the waves that were causing the, the commotion are vanished. The wind that was pushing the waves is gone, that the effects of everything in the storm around them vanish as God speaks. When God speaks. You know, there's nations who have opposed God over the centuries. They try to push out any faith in Christ, any faith in the, the one true God. And every one of those kingdoms have come and gone, places like Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome and Nazi Germany and communist Russia. They roared for a season and then God spoke and they are no more. God has sovereignty over the nations. God has sovereignty over the affairs of mankind. And though it may feel that the nations are raging, when God chooses to speak, they go silent. And his nation, his kingdom, reigns and rules today while they don't. Then it says this, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That um, actually is a reminder of a hymn. Um, it's many, many of you probably know this hymn and, and love it. It goes something like this. You know that one? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. That's all you get. <laughs> That's the best I can do. I started low. <laughs> A mighty fortress is our God. This was penned by a man named Martin Luther, and this was his inspiration, Psalm 46. And he says, listen, my God is a fortress. And I want you to know who Martin Luther is. Martin Luther was in the 16th century, and he was raised a good Catholic boy, and he became a monk, and he's studying the scriptures in Latin because the, the, the Bible wasn't in the people's language in that day, and you had to learn Latin through the church in order to be able to read the scriptures yourself. And as he's reading the Latin scripture, the word of God, it, he realizes that salvation and a relationship with God isn't earned through a sacrament or works or, or, or trying to earn it yourself, that it's a free gift of God through through faith in Christ alone. And when he discovers this profound truth, it renovates and, and changes his life. And he receives the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. And he becomes born again in a, into the family of God. And he's so excited about his faith, he be, tries to reform the Catholic church from within saying, listen, we've been teaching the wrong thing. God's forgiveness is available to all who come to faith in Christ, turning from their sins and turning to him. But the Catholic Church rejects that. They excommunicate him out of the church. In fact, they be he becomes the most wanted guy by the Catholic Church. They wrote a pamphlet called A Boar in the Vineyard, 
uh, denouncing his teachings and even put a price on his head. Martin Luther was responsible for the Protestant Reformation in Germany that brought the Bible into the German language and brought salvation to millions and millions of people and started a den denomination called the Lutherans that we still have today. And when they wanted his head on a platter, you know what his song was? A mighty fortress is my God. He doesn't move. He's a bulwark. That's a defensive uh, element in a fortress. He says, he's the one I can run to and am safe. When men rail against me and they're trying to kill me, my God is my fortress. And I will not be shaken. Instead of fear, I trust in my fortress God. Then verse 8, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. It's saying, listen, look at what God has done through the course of history. That throughout the course of history, God's purposes have prevailed, starting with uh, the nation of Israel in Genesis 14. When the Canaanite kings came against the plan of God, they were, they were brushed aside. When, when King Nebuchadnezzar tried to exert his rule over the throne of God, God humbled him. When Pharaoh tried to deny the work of God, God brought him to his knees. When Alexander the Great and Hitler and Mao Zedong and a bunch of other bad guys try to oppose the will of God, they get humbled before God. And you learned some of that stuff in history class. You probably forgot it. And history always teaches us the, element, I mean, the instrumental cause the instrumental cause is, is how uh, God uses things and people for his purposes, meaning like the Greeks overcame the Persians. We learned that, that that happened and that's true, but they were the instrumental cause, meaning they were the instrument in the hand of God, that he isn't the instrumental cause, that he is the efficient cause, that God is the cause behind the cause, that God's plan through history has been working according to his plan because he has deemed it as such. You know, early in his career, Napoleon was asked, what side is God on? And he said the side with the bigger cannons, brushed it all off. Later in life, he said this, Men propose, but God dispose, meaning God's will is sovereign. He's the one who decides the winners and the losers. God is the one whose will is sovereign over the nations and over our lives. And when we look at history, that God is the efficient cause, is working all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, that God and his sovereignty, even though we would not have thrown tragedy and hardship into this world, somehow uses those things, the things you and I would fear, for his ultimate purpose purposes that he would be glorified because you know when the nations shake when our foundation is moved when we become unsettled then and sometimes only then we turn our eyes to heaven and his purpose is served through it that's also why we need to read god's word when we read his word, we see over and over again, it strengthens our faith that when God's people need help, that God is the one who delivers them as they turn to him, that he is the efficient cause that causes his plan to succeed, that, that though the earth shakes and the nations tremble and the oceans roar, that God's people don't have to. Because God rules sovereignly over all the earth. You know who King Josiah is in the Old Testament? This is later in, in Jewish history. And the people of God had gotten away from the things of God. In fact, they'd even lost their copy of God's word. And Josiah, as he's cleaning out the temple, they find a copy of God's holy word. And he begins to read the scriptures for himself. And he realizes that they're in trouble. And he tears his robe as an act of repentance and humility. And he calls the people to fast and, and repentance. He says, listen, we don't have to fear the Assyrians or the, or the Babylonians or the the 
Egyptians. The only one we are to fear is God himself. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? We only need to fear that we would be walking with our God, trusting in him, worshiping him alone, following him with our whole hearts, and he will sovereignly rule over us. He'll defeat our enemies. He'll fight on our behalf. He'll make our crops prosper. He will bless our children. We'll be fruitful and multiply. That the blessings of God are for those who not only know him, but they trust him. They trust him. Now it says this. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. God is sovereign over the whole world. He can take care of you wherever you are and whatever you're facing. He is there. He is there to the ends of the earth. He was with Daniel in Babylon, a pagan place that didn't fear God, that didn't know God, and yet Daniel prospers in that place. He was with Joseph in Egypt when Joseph was surrounded by nobody of the faith. God prospered him and blessed him in Egypt, a pagan land. God, he was with Esther in, in, uh, in Persia when she was surrounded by people that wanted to exterminate the Jews. God used her and blessed her and caused his hand to prosper the Jewish people. Yeah, I believe in 2020, God can be with us today. How about you? Regardless of what we're facing today, he is sovereign over the government that rules. He is sovereign over all the governments that rule. He is sovereign over the calamities that we'll face. He's sovereign over the pandemics that may come. He is sovereign over the injustices we see. He's sovereign over the hate that is in the heart of mankind. Our God is still sovereign. And he doesn't move. And we can trust him. And he shatters the weapons of man that are pointed against his people. Do you realize that? Anytime somebody tries to do ill against God's people and, it, and God says no, he stops it. He shatters the spear and the sword. See, we have an all-powerful God so that in him we can have overriding peace. So God has been inspiring the writer of Psalms to say all this, but then God interjects here in verse 10, and this is the most familiar verse of the whole chapter. And God says something kind of first person. He says, I'd like the floor if that's okay. Let me, let me say a few things. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. God says, hush, be silent be still. And the roar goes silent. Just like when Jesus rebuked the waves and the wind, he says, be still. God says, I have a purpose in all of this, that I would be exalted. And even though you and I wouldn't choose the tragedies around us, that God in his sovereignty has chosen them because in them, he will be exalted. See, it's in the stillness with God in that quiet place by the stream of water, in that, in that fortress of God, in that ever-present God, in the strength of God. It's in that moment when we get still with our God, we can distinguish between the havoc of man and the substance of God, and we find rest. It's there that we find rest. See, if we're not still, we'll get caught up in all the other things going around and we'll forget who our God is, that he is this river of peace, that he is this fortress, that he is this strength, that he is all that we need. We'll forget and we'll get our eyes on all the chaos in the world around us and we forget who he is. And we will feel insufficient in that moment because we are. But if we remember, when we get still and remember who God is, we're always reminded he's sufficient. He's sufficient. In fact, he's more than enough 
for what we need. The last verse of the chapter says this, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's saying two things. Listen, he is the infinite almighty God that every bit of power that could ever be accumulated is owned by God himself, that he is all powerful. And not only that, he is also personal, that he's the God of Jacob, that God is both all powerful and yet present in the lives of daily people. And he's both. If he was just powerful but not present, we, would, we don't know if he cares for us. But if, if he was pro- personal but not powerful, we don't know that he can do what he claims he can do. He is both. He's sufficient. He's more than enough. So here's the daily decision. Just like Peter, when Jesus was walking on the water out to the boat, Peter sees him come and he says, if that's you, Lord, let me walk out to you. And we always, we always give Peter a bad time because he sinks, right? We know the end of the story. But think about that. He's the only one that stepped out of the boat and said, let me walk to you. He had to walk on water. That's so cool. And as long as he kept his eyes on Christ, man, it didn't matter how much waves and wind and, and splashing and everything was going on. He was good. He was walking on water. But the moment he took his eyes off the Lord and started to notice the wind and the wave, and that got his attention and that got his focus, he sunk. So every day we have to decide, are we going to find the stillness and put our eyes and our focus on the sovereign, eternal God? Are we going to get consumed with the things out there that cause worry and fear and doubt and insecurity? It's a daily choice to place our eyes on the sovereign source of peace. I'm going to close with a story about a man named Dr. Marshall. He was invited to come speak at the Navy Academy Chapel one Sunday morning. And he had prepared a message and he was, he was about to get up there. He leaned over to the guy and invited him and said, listen, I can't, I can't give the message I had planned to give. I really feel like God is telling me that I need to speak on God has conquered death and that we have nothing to fear because God has conquered even death. And so he gets up and he begins to give this message. And in that message, he tells a story of a little boy that has terminal illness and the family knows he's dying and the little boy even knows he's dying. And one day he asked his mom, he said, mom, what's it like to die? And God gave her a great answer. She said, you know, when you play all day and you get tired and you just lay down on the floor and you fall asleep, I said, yeah. And then you wake up the next morning in your bed. She said, your, your father comes in his big, strong arms and he picks you up and he carries you to the safe place where you need to be. She said, you know what? Death is just like that. That one day your heavenly father will come and grab you in his sure loving arms and carry you where you need to be. And with other words, he encouraged and challenged those young men and women at the Naval Academy to trust God, that he is the God who has even conquered death. And then driving home in his car that day, he turns on the radio and he hears a very sobering announcement because it's December 7th, 1941, in the same hour that he's preaching this message, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And those very people that he gave this message to would be the naval officers that would fight the war in the Pacific. And God had a message for them that day. Though you may fear de- face death in the war that is to come upon us, you shall not fear because I'm with you. Do we feel fear sometimes? Yes. Will we be dominated and and controlled by our fear? No. Our God is sovereign and in him we find rest. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today that what this world is insufficient to give us, true peace and rest, and even gladness in the storms of life, it's insufficient to give us. What we and ourselves are insufficient to manufacture in our own hearts, you are sufficient to provide. That there's a stream that flows from the very presence of God into the believer who knows and trusts God. And God, I pray for your people today. 
that we would be people that drink from the well of living water that never runs dry and find a gladness and a peace. In the storms of life, we have peace. We have rest. We even have gladness because we trust in you today. In fact, if that's your declaration to God today, that you've been, you've been facing fear, you've been, you've been controlled by fear, you've been manipulated by fear, you've had anxiety and worry and insecurity festering in your life, that today is the day you say, no longer will I live in fear because of who my God is. You tell God that right now. God today, I will rest in you. God today, deliver me from my fear. God today, be sovereign over my life. May I trust you. Give me the grace to trust you today. And tomorrow when I wake up, I will fix my eyes upon you. And I will not be shaken. And God, I pray for the person in this room or watching online who who has none of those assurances. They don't know the peace that comes from God because they don't know you. And there's no assurances in this life and there's nothing but judgment awaiting them in the next. And the need of the, the hour for them today right now is that they would come into relationship with you, not based on their own merits, not because they're going to try harder from this day forward, not because they're a good person, but because they receive the forgiveness you offer through your son, Jesus. If that's where your heart is today and you're ready to receive Christ as the one who will forgive you of your sins and lead you from this day forward and and. and usher you into eternity one day, then you pray with me. Say, God, today I'm letting go of any, any measure, any action, any behavior that could earn favor with you. I'm insufficient. You tell them that. But I believe Jesus died in my place, paid for my sin, rose from the dead to give me life. And so today I receive that free gift, turning my life over to Jesus and receiving his forgiveness in full. Will you come in and lead me from this day forward and be be my peace and my gladness forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us?
same God who split the Red Sea so his people could walk through on dry ground will go with you and I through whatever we face. Isn't that good news? Have a seat for just a second. We can trust who God is regardless of what that is. In fact, I'm going to point your attention to the connect card. It says if you're shifting your focus from what's going on out there back to who God is to calm your fears. Let us know that. And if that, if this is a breakthrough kind of moment for you today, I just want to be praying for you in the days ahead. And then also, if you want to sign up for the uh, Connect to Crossroads class next Sunday, uh, let us know on the Connect card as well. Again, you can drop that in the offering in the baskets as you head out today. Before you do, we have a, a really cool announcement. It's a video announcement about some really thing, cool things happening in our children's ministry. So uh, take a look. Whoa! 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 Welcome to Project Woe. The Pathways fundraisers to complete the new children's wing at Crossroads Church of Jackson County. Project Woe has two phases. Phase one is making the classroom as usable for our students. And that's where you come in. We need $50,000 for this phase to finish these rooms. Project Woe phase one will be running from July of 2020 through October 31st of 2020. But since we're raising money for the kids, let's make this a little bit more fun. Not only will you be helping raise money for an amazing cause, you're also raising money to help give someone a makeover. A hair makeover? Now this is Keith. He's one of the drummers in our band here at Crossroads. Now when you guys donate money towards Project Woe, well, you get to decide which one of us is getting our hair colored. All right, so guys, if you want to donate using cash, what you want to do is grab one of the giving envelopes from the sanctuary, check the pathways box, 
and beside that write Abby, definitely Abby, or Keith, and the name you write is the person you're voting for to have their hair colored. Now, if you want to use a check, it's even easier. All you have to do is write that name in the memo section, and it's done. If you want to donate online, here's what you do. Go to crossroadsjc.com and follow the prompts to our giving page. Once you're there, check the Pathways box and use the new memo section to note who you're voting for with your donation. So whichever person has the most money donated towards them by the end of October is the one getting their hair colored. That's right, but there's a catch. You're right, there is Keith. If overall, everyone collects the $50,000 goal, you guys get to pick the winner's hair color. Once everything is tallied up and the winner's hair color is selected, we'll be heading over here to 52 West Swan and Winder to begin the process. We here at Crossroads are so excited to be partnering with 52 West Salon for Project Woe. If we raise all of this money up by Halloween, then we should be able to have phase one of construction done by January 1st, and that will get us some usable spaces, so we're really excited about that. Oh yeah! For phase two, we're gonna whoa it up! When you first walk in the door, you'll be greeted by two new self-check-in kiosk stations nestled inside of 3D trees next to the Younger Preschool Clubhouse for ages two through three. Your little ones will learn with Ollie the Owl about how Jesus wants to be their forever friend. Moving past the check-in village, you'll enter our nursery park where little things are growing. Our team is also creating a new bathroom area for our students along with our volunteers to utilize. Safety is our top priority. Across from Nursery Park is the older preschool food truck row for ages four and five. They'll sink their teeth into the juicy truths of how God is the one who made them and loves them. Next door to Food Truck Row is the fourth and fifth grade library. Your preteens will have their own space to grow and dig into the source of all knowledge, the Bible. And last but not least, we will be turning the current closed closet depot into Fire Station K3 for your kindergartner through third grade students. They'll learn how to be on fire for God and that they can trust God no matter what. Once the rooms themselves are finished, your money will go towards making this area look amazing. And if you have any supplies or items you believe will work with our new spaces and beans, they are greatly appreciated. Please contact the church first before dropping them off. Our goal with Project Woe is to engage our children's imaginations while Jesus is at work engaging their hearts. Join us in helping our kids say, Whoa! about Jesus. We're excited about what's in store for our kids and the kids that God will be sending to our church. I hope you'll get excited about us, not only about the hair color, but what it's going to mean for reaching families and young kids for Christ here at Crossroads. Hey, last thing I'll say before we go is we're going to give you a heads up next week because there's there's rise in cases of COVID um, pretty much everywhere, but certainly here also. We're going to start just doing a quick temperature scan as folks come in starting next Sunday. Uh, if there's anyone over 100.4, is when we'll have to ask you to watch online. So just be aware that that's going to be uh, happening moving forward. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.